Yeah, here we are at the entrance to Rampgill Low Level. This is what is called the horse level because it's big enough for a horse to enter the mine and pull the mine wagons which run on the railway tracks. It's driven about 1750 and the first attempt to mine here was unsuccessful. The company didn't find any lead ore. Another company then took over, drove a few more metres and found quite a lot of lead ore. This became one of the most successful mines in the area. And it continued to work till about 1922 as a zinc mine as well as a lead mine. When they mechanised the place and put a locomotive into it, they actually had to widen the passage. We've got cold feet at the back here, you know. The Villemontania company took over in late Victorian times. They were actually after zinc. In many areas they had to reinforce the roof using local materials. They lined it with cement and in some places it's just like walking through a concrete tunnel. It's an ore hopper. It's basically a timber frame and there's a series of iron plates which could be taken out one at a time to control the material which allowed to flow through. Yeah, it looks like it's collapsed in on itself. There's level in here. Yeah, we need a bit. Ramgill Level passes through several north-south cross veins. The rock is very soft and friable, and the effect of faulting has been to damage the rock. We have to keep a watch on this part of the mine that the roof does not fall in completely and block the tunnel. Over 200 years, with the rock pressures on each side, the walls are being squeezed inwards and the roof is being squeezed downwards. Eventually, it will collapse. Yeah, that's Bog on the surface, I really don't know. It's the orange colour because of the iron in the rocks, and then usually knows the mini gala pools. This is a really old part of the Nented Mines, which was driven before the Napoleonic Wars, some time before 1815, on the line of a geological fault, which has been filled with minerals, probably lead and zinc. And the miners have worked it by drilling and blasting in the ceiling, so they work upwards. And up above us you can see some timber holding back waste rocks, and that has also been coloured by the iron ochre that has run down in later years. So what about this black stuff covering the walls? Yes, it's interesting stuff, isn't it? It's very dense and shiny. It's probably got a lot of manganese in it. It's not worth mining as a mineral. It's at present in tiny quantities in the soft shale rocks. And as the water drips down through all the cracks in the fault line, it leaches the manganese out and then deposits it on the surface. This part of the mine was probably driven before 1790. The miners drove two different tunnels with railway track to have a nice even curve. This would originally been laid with a wood railway track made out of perhaps elm log. During the Napoleonic Wars, the price of lead rose so much in the UK that a lot of old mines were reopened and then relayed with iron rails. This is a part of the mine which is no longer used, so they built a stone retaining wall and then filled it behind with waste material. There's some steps up into a higher part of the mine working. Built 
so that a small horse or donkey could get up into the ramp section. The horse could be used to pull some mine wagons in a higher part of the mine working. Do we have an approximate date for these steps? They may date from about 1800. It's very common in the mines to find ancient graffiti of this type. The top one's dating from 1795. From some research in the church registers, you can often trace the people whose initials we might see on the rock. We know, therefore, that these are authentic graffiti. the original route into the further reaches of Scaleburn and the horse gin. It had fallen in many, many years ago, but modern explorers, they'd come in via an ore chute further along. They dug through that. I was the last person out of that shaft as it fell in round me. Then a number of years ago, a group dug through here, so made the horse gin once more accessible. This is Scaleburn horse whimsy. And originally this would be stood vertical, so it's attached to the ceiling above so it's actually fallen over but originally it would be something like that attached to the ceiling above us. A big timber bolted to the ceiling and attached to that is a big bearing block which held the top part of the whimsy. And the floor bearing which is a big lump of cast iron would have sat in this rounded hole and the rope would come off the drum over a pulley wheel in the ceiling and down a shaft which is behind us about 100 feet deep. This was a way of getting mechanised winding up before the days of diesel engines and electricity and steam engines. So we think this whimsy dates from about 1800 and it's just about unique in the UK. So what we have here are some pieces of some lead covered fuse. You can see the white lead oxide on the inside of the lead and inside that is a black core, that is the gunpowder. Fused traditionally in the mines was gunpowder inside a straw or a goose quill. If your fuse gets damp, you're not sure why it hasn't gone off. Is it because there was a problem with the explosives or is the fuse still slowly burning? What you don't want to be doing is walking towards a bomb which might go off in your face. The advantage of the lead one was, in wet conditions, all you had to do was crimp the ends and you could carry the fuse around with you relatively safely in terms it wasn't going to get wet. Yeah, you wouldn't want to fall into it, would you? No, I When the scrap men were lifting all the railway track from the mine sometime in the 1950s, they left a few whiskey bottles perched on the rocks here. Some of them were old and valuable brands, all empty of course. In about the 1990s, a bottle collector, unknown, came in and took all the bottles away. So what we're appealing now is that if you happen to have a whiskey bottle, probably empty, please bring it in and leave it here. It does look very like a set of shells. Following this rise of the geology, here we are on small foot cross vein in Rampfield level on the hanging shore branch on a very slight incline. So as you walk up, the water's running down, falling over each sleeper as we go up and get little plunge pools. You've got the junction of two tunnels here. And obviously, from time to time, they'd need to switch one lot set of horses onto the main line out from the other side. There it is. It's moving across. I can't believe they still switch. Poor horse to him just over there. 
Especially the ones that are hanging where they're sort of on the end of a string. Or bits of blue lace fungus with the formations on the end of them. And uh, that explains a lot of this stuff you see on the ground. You know, I've never actually seen a soft tape before. Like, it's soft tape. This inky area here, that's just incredible. Secondary mineralization. The water percolates through the rock and leaches out all of the minerals that are left behind. The black streaks are manganese and the white are calcium carbonate. The blue colour here is at the sink. The remains of two wooden hoppers from which the ore was tipped down. In the middle between the vertical planks would be a set of ladders. And right up at the top, the remains of the stone arching where the miners were working high up above us. So you're going up towards Pearl Sump there? Yes. The rope that comes down, the bottom of it, if you turn left rather than right, you end up in that route, which is distinctly more hairy. When the mines closed, the axles were, and the wagons were often taken out because the wheels and axles were the most expensive part. They were brought in from Hadfields in Sheffield, but the wagon chassis and the bodies were built locally. But here it's unusual to see a chassis and a set of wheels. There had been some kind of roof fall between here and the entrance and the miners were unable to take this wagon out. Just been told these wheels were rare. We have another yeah, couple of sets of wheels. Oh, one mum and I don't know. For winding engine. For winding something The miners would use low standard explosive. Aminol was an explosive developed to replace gunpowder to be slightly cheaper and have the effect of still lifting the rocks like gunpowder does without shattering them too much. At the outbreak of the war in 1914, mines became very important because they provided us with home supplies of lead and zinc. The U-boats prevented shipments of those minerals coming from Australia and Africa and the USA. This explosive was also used in the, in the trenches on the Western Front, but some of that aminol came here after 1918. The mines here closed about 1919, so it's a very short time when they might have used some of the surplus military explosives. In the old days, when they were drilling by hand, holes would be 150 millimetres, um, 300 mil, or if you're really lucky, 600, if you're on soft ground. It was hard work, but it wasn't particularly bad for your health. When the compressed air drills came in, you could actually drill holes which were metres long, and obviously it's much more efficient. This is a machine-drilled scraper to clean out a machine-drilled hole. Insert the rod into the hole and drag it slowly back, and it would clear all the dust out of the hole. The reason for that is, when you're pushing the, uh, the black powder in, even yeah. if you're using a wooden stick, if there's bits of material in there, it may cause a spark and detonate prematurely, sort of mm. killing the miner. You know, in the early days, it produced huge amounts of dust. They hadn't actually worked out the idea of water suppression. There's a good centimetre of dust on this. The miners suffered terribly from silicosis. On this area in front of us, where you can see there have been 
planks all over the floor, the miners sat and broke the large rocks up into smaller pieces and then stacked them, for example, behind us on the wall here. And so that saved them taking out of the mine rock which had no mineral in it, because there are no records left of how many guys worked here. But we could guess maybe six. A gang mineral is one such as, say, fluorospirobarites, which might not be economic at the time you were working, um, and so would be left behind as a dead as well by, say, the Victorian miners. Um, when you get into the 20th century, those minerals were no longer gang minerals and were the economic minerals. A brush is an essential part of the miners' equipment. So when you've mined out the big rocks and packed those in the mine wagon, they also swept up the small particles that were left behind. Very rusty and holy is a can for carrying gunpowder in. If we're attaching pipes to the wall, we need spikes like this. This one has got bent, but you can see the idea that the spike will be driven into the stone wall at the side of the mine, and then the air pipe rests on top of it there. We have a lot of vinegar bottles. We don't really know why the miners were bringing vinegar bottles in here. We don't even know whether they had vinegar in or whether perhaps they were bringing something more interesting like Guinness or pale ale. We have an awful lot of lead left here. If you went into an old man's mine, the really old ones, there wouldn't be a single speck left. Every single bit would be taken out. For the miners to have left this amount of lead, and it's quite common throughout the mine, it was too hard to remove. So it wasn't worth their while, so it suggests that the actual mineral deposits they were removing were incredibly rich. There's this huge and extensive mine, or series of mines, stretching oh, yeah. off into the distance. The fortunes were made. Yeah, fortunes were made. It went from you know, lead to zinc to then varieties and, and fluorospar. Mm -hmm. and all the, as the different, as industrial processes uh, required different minerals. The oar is waiting in the tubs, the snow's upon the fell. The canny folks are sleeping, yet the lead is ready to sell. So come, my little washer lad, come, let's away. You know it's very hard to work for fourpence a day. It's early in the morning, we rise at five o'clock. The little slurs come to the floor to knock, knock, knock. So come, my little washer lad, come, let's away. We're bound down to slavery for four pence a day.